This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. of 10 kids and, and a family. And my father was a Baptist church organist, so the entire family was in the choir, and dinner time usually ended with everyone humming, singing a hymn or something. So music was in the house constantly. Uh, we're either tapping on the table, my brothers played jazz drum, and people around the neighborhood all came by the house on Saturday night. So it was a lot of music in the household. My father regularly took me to concerts in New York, and Carnegie Hall, elsewhere. And I do remember hearing Franz Liszt play, particularly played by Gunnar Johansson at Carnegie Hall. And I think I was 10, 8, 10 years old. And I, and I think hearing someone like the music of Franz Liszt just fell right into that I, idea of music just entering the ear all day. And what captivated me about Liszt was, was the phenom aspect of it. It was very flashy music. And I think for a kid, 5, 6, 8 years old, you're really taken by it. At least I was very taken by that. And I wanted to do it. I wanted to drive the car fast. I wanted to get sucked into that uh, virtuoso world that Liszt had created early in his life. And I think as I stayed with Franz Liszt into my teenage years as a young adult, um, I got to see what he saw. I got to see as his music began to mature that you can use that virtuosity to create sound images. And in Liszt's case, those sound images uh, were based on bits and pieces of philosophy that he put together pretty much on his own. He was a, pretty much a self-taught musician, self-educated man. Uh, his school, formal schooling ended at age eight. That as he was learning more, as he was self-teaching uh, himself about the great literature and philosophy, he was imbuing those thoughts in his musical compositions. So I guess I started, one, being captivated by the virtuosity of the music, the really in, in, sexy, enticing aspect of playing fast and loud, to then using that virtuosity to create sound images based upon deeper meanings and deeper texts. The Naked List is a stage adaptation of a much longer documentary film I'm making on Franz Liszt. Here we are 200 years after his birth and there's so little known about this fascinating composer uh, the most famous musician of the 19th century and someone who really helped to set the stage for the developments in music in the 20th century. So that um, I, th I would like to use the Naked List uh, in tour to sort of introduce a much larger project, a project that uh, attempts to look at the 75-year career of the man who knew every king, queen, pope, Duke, Duchess of Europe throughout the 19th century. I hope The Naked List makes, drives people to the li library to study more about this really unknown figure of, of three centuries, this figure who shaped music in his own time and through his legacy shaped music after his death. of Franz Liszt. This is the music of Franz Liszt. The faces and sounds barely tell the story of the most famous and celebrated musician of the 19th century. He was the epitome of the Byronic legend, known for his prowess as a pianist. Pianist, composer, father, friend, entrepreneur, conductor, author, benefactor, biographer, Capellmaster, Abbe, lover. He was a study in contradictions. His consummate abilities as a piano virtuoso accentuated his flamboyance. The showman who loved the stage, who lived for the applause. But there was another side to his personality, an ascetic side 
that inexorably drew him nearer and nearer to his Catholic roots. Born in 1811, the year of the Great Comet, the year that night became day all across the Northern Hemisphere, from Russia to the Adirondacks. Liszt was a man of three centuries. He was taught only briefly by the masters of the 18th century. He led and inspired each of the movements of the 19th century and broached new avenues in tonality in the 20th. Liszt dined with popes, kings, and queens, but he danced with the gypsies when with one he understood the other. We invite you to join us as we celebrate the bicentenary of this gifted son of Hungary who spoke no Hungarian. Trained in Austria, was celebrated in France, lionized in Russia, feted in Italy, revered in England, and buried in Germany. This afternoon, through selections from his 10,000 letters, we will tell the long and fascinating story of the life and music of Franz Liszt, the first European. We start with the first and only real piano teacher Franz Liszt ever had, Carl Czerny. A man with a small boy of about eight years approached me with a request to let the youngster play something on the forte piano. He was a pale, sickly-looking child who, while playing, swayed about on the stool as if drunk. His playing was also quite irregular, untidy, confused, and he had so little idea of fingering that he threw his fingers quite arbitrarily all over the keyboard. But that notwithstanding, I was astonished at the talent which nature had bestowed on him since I had little time during the day, I devoted almost every evening to the boy, Carl Cheney. That untidy little boy was nine-year-old Franz Liszt, born in 1811, the year of the Great Comet. For Adam Liszt, the comet was the sign that every father looks for when holding a new son to the heavens. Adam's dreams had come true on the night of October 22nd in the year of the comet the year of the comet, the year of Franz Liszt. The boy grew to display an uncommon ear for music and the ability to play the piano at an early age. He was the only child in a family that lived in the small provincial village of Riding along the contested border between Hungary and Austria. His mother, Anna, was the daughter of a baker. His father, Adam, earned his living as an accountant for the vast sheep herds belonging to the ruling Esterhazys. Adam was also an amateur musician who recognized talent when he heard it. From infancy, the child heard the chamber music of Beethoven, Haydn, and Mozart performed in the home, developing his ear for the highly organized music of German masters. Through the window of their cottage, however, came something else the ancient haunting melodies and second beat rhythms of the gypsies, the Roma, who were the largest minority group in Hungary. Their improvisations and frenetic passions captivated him too. Franz Liszt would spend the next seven decades marrying these two cultures into a single romantic musical image. Those who heard the child play regarded him as the greatest musical prodigy since Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. Adam was to take his wife and the remarkable young son to Vienna, where they hoped for their son to be trained and most importantly, discovered for what they believed him to be, a genius. Leaving his post in writing was a risky step for Adam and the family, but this was no chartless voyage. It was a carefully calculated risk. They began by following the footsteps of another legendary stage parent. This is exactly what Leopold Mozart had done with his gifted prodigy 60 years earlier. Adam kept in his pocket a published map of the Mozart family grand tour. He knew that Franzi would not receive the proper training and inspiration his gifts deserved, let alone be discovered in the backwaters of Hungary. No, it had to be Vienna, and it had to be sooner rather than later. In Vienna, Adam secured musical composition lessons from none other than Antonio Salieri, 
composer to the royal court of Vienna and Mozart's celebrated tormentor. For instruction in the piano, there couldn't be any other choice than Karl Czerny, Beethoven's best student and personal secretary. Both Salieri and Czerny taught young Liszt without charge, a model of generosity that Liszt would emulate for decades with his own students. The 12 transcendental etudes composed by Franz Liszt in 1852 are dedicated to his beloved piano teacher. It is not too strong to say that Karl Czerny set Franz Liszt on the path to become the pianist of the century, theirs and ours.
Czerny took away all of the child's music and set him to a strict daily dose of scales and exercises to perfect his technique. For hours on end, young Liszt obediently practiced for perfection. But Adam was as impatient as he was ambitious. Having left his secure post with the Esterhazis, he was now running out of money. He had a wrist all on the precocious hands of his son. Adam wanted to put Franzi in front of those who could make a difference between an undiscovered talent and a lucrative future. But time was running out. Adam's impatience was not just with Carl Czerny. He was impatient with Vienna. He sought an audience for his talented son with Ludwig von Beethoven, the most famous composer in the German-speaking world. Czerny agreed to petition the maestro to hear the young virtuoso. Here is the operative word. Beethoven was totally deaf by 1822 and quite irascible. The idea of granting an audience to one of the many child piano prodigies in Vienna at that time was far from his wishes. But Karl Czerny persisted. Then for God's sake, bring the little rascal. <laughs> the master is reported to have shouted in despair. That Beethoven agreed to receive the little bugger and his father is beyond dispute. <laughs> Beethoven's only connection to the hearing world was through a collection of conversation books that come down to us through history. All questions and comments were written down in these books. His reply can only be gleaned from the half of the encounter that was written. <laughs> <laughs> Little Franzi wrote to Beethoven, I have often expressed the wish to Herr Czerny to make your acquaintance, and I rejoice now to be able to do so. As I shall give a concert on Sunday the 13th, I most humbly beg you to give me your high presence. What? Cherney boldly pressed the boy's case even further. Little Liszt had urgently requested me humbly to beg you for a theme on which to improvise at his concert tomorrow. Unbelievable! Adam succeeded in his attempt to put Franzi before the most important musician in the world. But a career-propelling endorsement was out of the question. It is hard to believe that Beethoven provided a melody for the youngster to improvise upon. Nor is it likely that a man totally deaf and so difficult as Beethoven would attend the concert of a child of the future when the present had vanished in his own ears. Over the next half century, Liszt would tell different versions of this moment in history. Did Beethoven derive any enjoyment or pleasure from listening to this youngster play the piano? Was Beethoven so taken by his brilliance that he leaned over to kiss the child on the forehead Diviacus, or kiss of consecration. Did it ever happen? I doubt it, and so do most scholars. But hey, why let the truth stand in the way of a good tale? <laughs> Adam's instincts were correct. The hard truth was that by 1822, the cultural life of Vienna was in decline. The masters of the past were either dead, deaf, or dying. Mozart had been a model. Beethoven was their idol, and Schubert, well, he lived next door to Beethoven in relative obscurity. Adam now set his sights on the emancipating glitz and turmoil of Paris. Paris, the home of revolutions in literature, dress, painting, and politics. Parisians had scrolled their signature on the principalities of Europe and looked also to make a lasting imprint on the new world and the new century. This time, Adam knew that the trip would be much further in distance, language, and custom. It would be a do-or-die, one-way trip. Franzi would now continue his training amid the liberating ether of a city quite literally on fire. <laughs> The move to Paris was the act of Adam the father and Adam the impresario. Ever the consummate businessman, Adam arranged concerts for his child prodigy along the way to defray expenses. Franzi was hailed and welcomed as a conquering young hero. 
Or at least, that's what Adam painted on the posters that lined the streets. On the second day after arriving in Paris, Adam presented his brilliant son to the Paris Conservatory for admission. The director was the celebrated Italian opera composer Luigi Cherubini. He informed them that the city was overrun with foreign prodigies and that the board of directors had recently passed a new rule to forbid the enrollment of foreign pianists. Franzi was rejected. Not so coincidentally, the family rented rooms directly across the street from French piano maker Erard. Sebastian Erard immediately saw the marketing potential of this boy genius to help him sell pianos. It was a match made in heaven. Coca-Cola meets Walmart. <laughs> Listen, students, you might think today that being turned down by an institution of higher learning is a fatal career blow. But for Franz Liszt, it may have been a blessing in disguise. He was now free to continue his improvising, to write music with daring harmonies and rhythms, and to build his concert repertoire free of strict conservatory rules. With Adam in firm control of his career, Franz Liszt toured back and forth through France, Germany, and Great Britain. At each location, Erard provided a grand piano for the performance. In leaky vessels and in horse-drawn carriages, the father-son team were inseparable as they traveled together for a period of more than three years. In Paris, he was called Le, Le Petit, Petit List. List. Three years of incessant touring had taken a toll on both father and son. Adam was exhausted. While taking time for a holiday at the seashore, disaster strikes. Adam dies of typhoid fever just weeks before Franzi's 16th birthday. His father perhaps had been more manager than mentor, but how could Franz continue without him? Here he was on the verge of a brilliant career but now headed for a deep, rudderless depression. The loss of his father propels Franz to do deep soul searching. It is during this period that the brilliant prodigy grows into a man. He considers giving up music to study for the priesthood, but is persuaded not to. He flirts with various religious cults and finds some direction in the philosophies of Saint Simonism which put forth a theory of life with music at the center of human endeavor. Rooted in scientific realism, followers of St. Simonism believed in such revolutionary ideals as the redistribution of wealth, and ironically given his growing reputation as a womanizer in the emancipation of women. Adam had wanted for his son what every father wants for their children, success and prosperity. But now, who would be there to guide his son toward his destiny? From the grave, Adam's words rang in Liszt's ears. My son, you are predestined. You will realize that artistic goal whose spell bewitched my youth in vain. But be careful. Je crois pour toi la femme. I fear women in your life. Young Liszt had been the sole support of his family for four years. Now fatherless and without direction, he stopped concertizing and began teaching piano to the rich and titled children of Paris, whose parents sought out this celebrity teacher. His mother, Anna, remains in Paris to care for her teenage son. She worries as his personal habits begin to drift. He takes up drinking, keeps irregular hours, and frequents the cafes and salons of Paris. But how could the most talked about young musician in Paris resist the allure and excitement of the salon scene in Paris? Why should he? Would the Paris salon scene resist him? Why should it? 
1830s Paris was a hothouse, a hothouse for yet more revolution. The French salons were the new public sphere. Here, Liszt performed and discussed music, politics, religions, and the arts with the likes of Victor Hugo, Georges Sand, Hector Berlioz, Honore de Balzac, Heinrich Heine, and the painter Eugene Delacroix. However, perhaps the most important artistic friendship Liszt was to develop at the Salons was with a newly arrived Polish expatriate named Frederick Chopin. The feeling was mutual. In a letter to George Sand, Chopin revealed his admiration for Liszt, the pianist. I am writing without knowing what my pen is scribbling, because at this moment, Liszt is playing my etudes and putting honest thoughts out of my head. I should like to rob him of the way he plays my etudes. And Liszt held Chopin's music in the highest regard. He wrote, the preludes of Chopin are quite special compositions. They are not merely pieces, as the title suggests, intended to be played as an introduction to other pieces. Rather, they are poetic preludes, like those of a great contemporary poet, which lull the soul in golden dreams and raise it to ideal realms. They have the freedom and spaciousness characteristic of works of genius. Liszt contemplated the worth of the man Chopin and his music long after Chopin died too young at age 38. So much so that Liszt published his own very personal and affectionate biography on Frederick Chopin in 1877. He believed that it was his responsibility to make the gems from Chopin's pen better known throughout the world and for all ages. Few people at the time were aware that Liszt personally paid for the first publication of Chopin's piano works. Salons were frequently populated with men of political and economic standing. The women, more often than not, were beautiful, rich, young, and fully emancipated. Intrigue was the staple of the day. These were settings where a very handsome, exotic, extremely gifted and sexually potent young man like Franz Liszt would be noticed. One woman, woman among many who noticed him was a beautiful, wealthy, intelligent countess named Marie Dagou. Her first impressions of Liszt were captured in this diary entry. Madame Levaille was still talking when the door opened and a wonderful apparition appeared before my eyes. I used the word apparition because I can find no other to describe the sensation aroused in me by the most extraordinary person I have ever seen. He was tall and extremely thin. His face was pale and his large sea green eyes shone like a wave when the sunlight catches it. His expression bore the marks of suffering. He moved indecisively and seemed to glide across the room in a distraught way, like a phantom, for whom the hour when it must return is about to sound. Between us, there was something at once very young and very serious, at once very profound and very naive. Marie Dagou. Marie was 28 and Franz barely 21 when they met. She was as beautiful as she was moody, already exhibiting the jealousy and debilitating fits of depression that to plague her always. Aptly described as six inches of snow covering 20 feet of lava. <laughs> she was unhappily married to Count Charles Dagout. She was deeply ensconced in Parisian salon circles, holding her own soirees at her elegant left bank mansion or at her exquisite chateau, Quasi, just outside of Paris. Marie had been a faithful wife to Count Dagou, but life with a dashing Hungarian virtuoso in the time of revolution proved too irresistible. Dear Charles, I'm going to leave you. We are going to separate forever. 
Whatever you may think, it is not without cruel anguish and bitter tears that I have been able to make a decision like this. You have always thought of me, never of yourself. And despite this, I am unhappy. On the grave of Louise, our departed daughter, I ask for forgiveness. And in her name, this is what I request from you. I will always speak of you with the respect and esteem which you deserve. As for me, society will heap abuse on me. And I ask you only to say nothing. Adieu, Marie. Within two years of meeting, Marie and Franz were expecting their first child. Fearing the scandal their openly adulterous relationship would cause, the lovers, with great secrecy and subterfuge, eloped to Switzerland, where Blandine was born in late 1835. So began their eight-year, on-again, off-again relationship during which time they led a semi-nomadic existence wandering through Switzerland and Italy with periodic returns to Paris. These years of pilgrimage are captured in book one of List's three-part suite, L'Année de Pèlerinage. This piece, At Lake Wallenstadt, is from that set. I cannot listen to this piece without weeping. I cannot imagine you in the arms of another woman without going out of my mind. Your breath is still on my lips and eyelids. How ardent, how glowing on my lips is your last kiss. Your heartbeats are still mingled with mine and are infinitely prolonging this intense double life which we have revealed to each other. Your every word burns with an inner flame. There is only one name that I repeat every hour. Your look still seemed to be magically radiant in the sky. All day long, I felt as if we were among countless choirs of angels and celestial figures, taking part in some mysterious festival which was both new and eternal. Even today, I would give up my place in heaven for six happy months with you. You are not the right woman for me. But you are the woman I want. Franz, I will continue to be your mistress, but I will not be one of your mistresses. Well, you know my way of looking things like that. You are so strong, you do not make allowances for the weaknesses of others. You ask me for permission to be unfaithful? You are trying too hard to be superior. You are too much of a philosopher. At first, they were too much in love to notice that what drew Marie to Franz Liszt, his celebrity and fame, also repelled her. In her wealthy aristocratic circles, musicians were little more than servants in the family employ. Why he felt compelled to concertize at distant venues was a mystery to her. But he could no longer resist the temptation to perform. So in 1839, Liszt embarks on a series of worldwide tours that take him from England to Russia and beyond. By the time of their tumultuous breakup in 1844, there were three children, Blandine, Cosima, and Daniel, who were sent to be lovingly raised in Paris by their grandmother, Anna Liszt. The stormy relationship of Marie and Liszt was captured in a thinly disguised 1839 novel by Balzac entitled Beatrix. This only serves to confirm the ancient axiom, when the fact becomes legend, print the legend. 
Biographers have too often focused upon Liszt's years of pilgrimage merely as a love story about Franz and Marie. But these years were also a period of significant strides in his musical life and collaborations. He had become the most talked about musician in all of Europe. It was also a period when signature compositions were conceived. The Glanzite years, the years of splendor. That's what historians call the 10 years between 1838 and 1848, when Liszt embarked on a continuous world tour performing in every known and unknown corner of the European musical world. It is during this period that the legend of Franz Liszt the pianist was established. No less an authority than Danish poet Hans Christian Andersen recounts one performance. When Liszt entered, it was as if an electric shock passed through the salon. I was standing quite near to the artist who was a thin young man, his long dark hair hanging around his pale face. He bowed and sat down at the piano. He seemed to me a demon who was nailed fast to the instrument from whence the tones were streaming forth. They came from his blood, from his thoughts. He was a demon trying to play his soul free. But as he continued to play, the demonic disappeared. I saw his pale face assume a nobler and brighter expression. The divine soul shone from his eyes, from every feature, became beautiful as spirit and enthusiasm can make one. Nowhere was Liszt more enthusiastically received than in Berlin. The normally staid German audiences appeared to give themselves over completely to Listomania, a term coined by the press to describe the phenomenon. There were reports that, quote, insane female fans even carried glass vials about their persons into which they poured his coffee dregs. <laughs> Others collected his cigar butts, which they hid in their cleavages. <laughs> After giving 21 concerts in 10 weeks in 1841, Liszt was driven out of the city in a coach drawn by six white horses, followed by 30 other coaches. The University of Berlin suspended classes for the day, and King Wilhelm IV and his queen waved goodbye from the palace window. After Berlin, he willingly suffered the required 10-day quarantine to enter Constantinople for a series of concerts. Even at such a remote venue, Erard sent one of his finest pianos for Liszt to perform on before His Majesty the Sultan Abdul Medua Khan in 1847. Somehow, he also found time to compose during the Glantzite years. The first drafts of his 19 Hungarian rhapsodies began to appear. These compositions freely draw upon Hungarian folk tunes and gypsy performance practices. Like jazz today, each rhapsody follows the same improvisatory format. They begin with a slow, dramatic narrative, the lasan, then gradually build momentum, culminate in a fast-paced dance section called the friska, before collapsing into a slower, reflective recitative. Liszt named these pieces rhapsodies after the ancient Greek word for orator, or rhapsode, whose rhapsody of words enshrined the history and epic deeds of the Greek people. As the composer of Hungarian rhapsodies, Liszt saw himself as a national bard, translating a conversation between Hungarian folk music and the haunting improvisatory ideals of the landly gypsies that shared his native land. For now, it is enough for us to appreciate the fact that Franz Liszt embraced the gypsy not as other, but as neighbors, as well as fellow human beings and citizens. The Liszt Hungarian Rhapsody is part dream, part story, part improvisation, and part epic. It is without a doubt all Hungarian. <laughs>
By today's standards, Franz Liszt would be considered the first real rock star, the Michael Jackson of his time. He cultivated celebrity, yes, but he took it seriously and used it as a platform to convey deeper notions about the role of artists in the world. He believed that great artists, those whom their creator had blessed with genius, were a noble breed, and like their aristocratic counterparts, had obligations, or what he called le genie oblige, the obligation to serve something larger than themselves. When Liszt walked out on the concert stage bearing his medals and the Hungarian sword of honor, he thought of himself in ministerial terms, an artist with a mission. Franz Liszt was changing what it meant to be an artist in the post-Napoleonic world. During his world tours, he had single-handedly created the public audience, a public willing to pay to hear and, more importantly for him, see a concert. Public comments said it all. When formerly I heard of the fainting spells which broke out in Germany, and especially in Berlin when Liszt showed himself there, I shrugged my shoulders and said, this is Listomania. Suddenly there was a commotion in the hall. We all turned around and saw Liszt. He was wearing a white cravat. Over it the Order of the Golden Spur, which had just recently been given to him by the Pope. Most startling of all was his enormous mane of fair hair. In those days, no one in Russia would have dared to wear his hair that way. It was strictly forbidden. Just at that moment, Liszt, noting the time, walked down from the gallery, elbowed his way through the crowd, and moved quickly toward the stage. But instead of using the steps, he leaped onto the stage. He tore off his white gloves and tossed them onto the floor under the piano. He seated himself at the piano. Instantly, the hall became deadly silent. Without any preliminaries, Liszt began to play the opening cello phrase of the William Tell Overture. As soon as he had finished, and while the hall was rocking with applause, he moved swiftly to a second piano facing in the opposite direction. Throughout the concert, he used the pianos alternately for each piece facing first one and then the other half of the hall. We had never in our lives heard anything like this. We had never been in the presence of such a brilliant, passionate, demonic temperament. At one moment rushing like a whirlwind, at another pouring forth cascades of tender beauty and grace. Liszt's playing was absolutely overwhelming. On a very cold February night in 1847, Liszt stepped onto a stage in Kiev and performed what would be one of the last concerts that he would ever give in public again for money. He was 36 years old and was weary. For 10 years, he had traipsed across Europe and Russia by horseback, carriage, and even dog sled to achieve the dreams of his father. He had amassed a fortune that was held and invested by the House of Rothschild in Paris for the benefit of his mother and his three children. Unlike many lesser prodigies who soon vanished from sight, he had become the most famous musician in the world. Now, at the height of his powers, he walks away. Why? He wanted more, a bigger palette on which to project a broader musical vision. In the audience that night in Kiev was one Princess Karoline von St. Wittgenstein, sole heir to a wealthy landowner from the Polish Ukraine. Like Marie Dagou, Karoline was the unhappy pawn in an arranged marriage and presently living estranged from her husband. Both Franz and Karoline were at the height of their fortunes but each in different ways was looking for greater meaning in their lives. Their meeting that night changed the life paths for both of them and began a relationship that would last for four decades. Ever since his successes in Germany, Liszt had been wooed by the Grand Duke of Weimar to take the permanent position of Kapellmeister Extraordinaire. 
In fact, the Grand Duke had gone so far as to appoint Franz Liszt Kapellmeister extraordinaire in 1842. Carl Alexander spent the next seven years trying to get Liszt to show up. <laughs> On August 31st, 1846, he writes to Liszt in Spain. I hope that you will not be annoyed with me if I disturb uh, for a moment in the middle of your activities. I am picking up the pen and ask how it goes. Uh, do not bear a grudge if I slip Weimar's name into your plans. Hearing no word, a month later, the Grand Duke writes again to Liszt, this time in Portugal. I have heard nothing from you. Herr Grunwald spoke to me of your concerts in Vienna last season. He told me that you were working a lot. So, I regret not hearing from you about the task that I wish to impose on you, namely, building up the musical fortunes of Weimar. Still not a word. There was no sign that Liszt was interested in coming to Weimar. Although I do not know where you are, and I have not heard from you in a long time, I could not forego the pleasure of writing to you. <laughs> I am writing to ask you to hasten your return to Weimar. God willing, it would crown your achievements if you brought the reply yourself. When commanding him to appear didn't work, Carl Alexander tried a kinder and gentle, gentler approach a few weeks later. I am longing to see you again. <laughs> you are esteemed, loved, and understood among us in Weimar. Finally, Liszt does reply in late 1846 in his now familiar florid style. I enjoy thinking first of Weimar, my fixed star. Its beneficent rays of light shine down on the long journeys of my life. I will always dare to say that it will become my desire to humbly link my efforts to Weimar's glorious traditions. Learning of Liszt's very successful concerts in Constantinople, the Grand Duke later writes, We can offer you uninterrupted time for music making. Concerts in the Sultan's harem, however, we cannot match. <laughs> Unknown to the Grand Duke, time and maturity had worked in his favor. By the conclusion of the Kiev concerts, Liszt was exhausted, but he was also in love. After a few short months of courtship, he, Caroline, and her young daughter Marie would make Weimar their home. The court of Weimar was not wealthy. Indeed, the moving force behind cultural and political affairs was Karl Alexander's mother, Grand Duchess Maria Pavlovna, the sister of Tsar Nicholas I of Russia. But how does the most famous man in Europe find solitude, even in the small provincial principality of Weimar? No sooner had he and his married mistress settled in Protestant Weimar in 1848 than musicians from all over the world trailed in his wake to this Thuringian city of 5,000. Within the first year, one especially destitute and desperate composer fell through the door. 35-year-old Richard Wagner fled to Weimar seeking the protection of Franz Liszt. He had been director of the Dresden Opera House, but he had also involved himself in the Dresden insurrections for which many of his cohorts had been executed. A warrant had been issued for his arrest, and thus began the 30-year relationship between the most famous artist in the world and the most difficult man in the world. <laughs> Despite the true affection each held for the other's accomplishments, a sampling of the over 300 letters between them tells us how this relationship began disastrously and only got worse. <laughs> you told me lately that you had closed your piano for some time, and I presume that for the present you have turned banker. I am in a bad state and cannot hold out for another week. 5,000 thalers, can you get me such a sum? Have you got it yourself, or is there someone else who would pay it for the love of you? Your most devoted, Richard Wagner. Dear friend, in answer to your letter, I have remitted 100,000 thalers to your wife at Dresden. Dear Liszt, 
with the confidence of one entirely helpless. I further ask, make it possible for me to have some money soon. Have I spoken plainly enough? <laughs> My purse is completely dry at this moment. And you are aware that the fortunes of the princess has been for a year without an administrator may be confiscated any day. My dear List, are you in good temper? Probably not, as you are just opening a letter from your plaguing spirit. I live at present only on the remainder of the money which I received from you. I implore you by all that is dear to you to raise and collect as much as you possibly can. My most esteemed friend, Richard, before thinking of myself, I must provide for the comfortable existence of my mother and my dear children in Paris. My concert career, as you know, has been closed for more than two years past, and I cannot resume it imprudently without serious damage to my present position and still more to my future. Franz, I have an inspired idea. You must get an Erard piano for me. Write to the widow, tell her a hundred thousand fibs, and make her believe that it is a point of honor for her that an Erard should stand in my house. Your most devoted friend and true admirer, Richard Wagner. Needless to say, Liszt never connived to get Wagner a free piano. But history does record the lengths to which Wagner went to beg and blackmail Franz Liszt for money. Their tortured relationship lasted for more than three decades and reveal how Liszt handled controversy throughout his life. Even when Wagner seduced Liszt's married daughter, Cosima, from her husband and three children, Franz Liszt remained an admirer and champion of the composer, but not the man. Wagner was an outspoken and rabid anti-Semite. Liszt was not. In fact, Liszt had cordial relations with the Jewish community wherever he lived, and was even invited to perform at the opening ceremonies of the great synagogue of Budapest, the largest in Europe in 1860. Nevertheless, Liszt, Liszt was often accused of being complicit in anti-Semitic views because of his close professional association with Wagner, the gifted bigot. The most enduring and beautiful collaborations between the two men are Liszt's piano transcriptions taken from Wagner's operas. Until the establishment of the Wagner Festival at Bayreuth at the end of the century, these piano transcriptions by Liszt were better known than the operas themselves and remain mainstays of the piano repertory today. Here is the most famous of these transcriptions from the last act of Tristan und Isolde, the beautiful and haunting Liebestod.
Liszt was a man of the world who corresponded with kings. It is remarkable that he continued to be supportive, almost docile in the face of Wagner's profound arrogance. But make no mistake, Liszt was no pushover. Once when Liszt was giving a recital in St. Petersburg, Tsar Nicholas arrived late and started talking to his aides during the music. Liszt paused. When the monarch inquired about the silence, Liszt replied, uh, Music herself should be quiet when Nicholas speaks. Oblivious to the rebuke, <laughs> oblivious to the rebuke, Nicholas asked Liszt to perform a recital to commemorate the Russian defeat of the French army at the Battle of Borodino. Liszt coolly replied, I owe my education and my celebrity to France. It is impossible for me to make common cause with her adversaries. The Tsar snorted. The long hair and political opinions of this man displease me. I let my hair grow in Paris, and I shall only cut it in Paris. And as for my political views, I have none, and shall have none until the day the Tsar deigns to put at my disposal 300,000 Barrett bayonets. No, this was not a man to suffer fools quietly. Well, maybe only the talented ones. <laughs> Franz Liszt was determined to reinvent himself in Weimar in two important ways. First, he takes up the baton to premiere symphonic works by a daring set of younger upstarts like Robert Schumann, Hector Berlioz, and the indefatigable Richard Wagner. In each case, what interested Liszt the conductor the most was the possibilities of the symphony as narrative, using the full dramatic range of the orchestra to tell an epic story. Prominent among his own compositions of the Weimar period are his 13 symphonic poems for orchestra. His second achievement in Weimar was to refashion earlier piano works into more mature compositions. The Hungarian Rhapsody and the Arne de Pellerinage undergo massive uptating and rig configuration. Influenced by his admiration for Beethoven, he also begins to compose large-scale, multi-movement piano works reminiscent of the German master's complex late keyword, keyboard among, works. Among these large-scale works are the Fantasy and Fugue on a Theme by Bach. The strangely demonic Scherzo in March. The 30-minute long Adnos Fantasy and Fugue, based on a melody from Meyerbeer's opera, The Prophets. And the signature long-form piano work from this period, the innovative B minor sonata. Five repeated notes, then a turn. Five repeated notes, then a turn. This idea, this motive, this simple nugget of an idea is just about all the music material there is to drive the entire 27 minutes of the B minor sonata. Like his idol Beethoven, Liszt employs the slightest bits of an idea to build an entire sonata. Just five repeated notes and then a turn. This figure is given a multitude of settings during the B minor sonata. He called this thematic transformation. Like his idol Beethoven, Franz Liszt would only write one piano sonata, but boy, what a masterpiece. But the B minor sonata was not well received by all of Liszt's fellow musicians. Like scores of other young composers, 20-year-old Johannes Brahms trekked to Weimar to meet the legendary Franz Liszt. When young Johannes was too shy to play his own works for the master, Liszt gathered up the unpublished Brahms score from the table and sight-read it to perfection. 
What happened in the next half hour changed the course of history and their relationship. Liszt decided to favor his guest by then playing his own B minor sonata in its entirety. About halfway through the 27-minute work, Liszt glanced over at his young listener only to observe that Brahms had fallen sound asleep. <laughs> the master ceased playing midstream and left the room. History proves that Johannes Brahms remained asleep to Liszt's music for the next half century. <laughs> Franz Liszt also admired Robert Schumann as a composer and conducted the premiere of Robert Schumann's symphonies at Weimar. Indeed, Liszt dedicated the B minor sonata to Robert Schumann in gracious reply for Schumann, dedicating his great C major fantasy to Liszt two decades earlier. But this apparent reciprocal gratitude did not prevent the Schumanns from severely criticizing Liszt's B minor sonata without a hearing. An entry in Clara Schumann's diary dated May the 25th, 1854 says it all. Liszt's sonata is merely blind noise. No healthy ideas anywhere, everything confused. One cannot find a single clear harmonic progression. And yet I must thank him for it. It is really too awful. 1859 brought the beginning of many crushing developments for Liszt. His chief benefactor, Grand Duchess Maria Polovna, dies early in the year. With her went the resources to keep the court orchestra going in Weimar. For 10 years, she had also interceded unsuccessfully with her brother, Tsar Nicholas I of Russia, to grant Princess Caroline an annulment so that she might marry a celebrity musical lover. But Nicholas had so far refused to help in this cause, influenced perhaps by the low opinion he had acquired of the virtuoso some years earlier. His children were now young adults and finding their own way in the world. He had maintained a deep but distant affection for Cosima, Blandine, and Daniel. His support had been chiefly financial, while his loving mother, Anna, was kept in charge of their upbringing in Paris. <coughs> Now his only son, Daniel, a brilliant law student, dies in Berlin at age 19. Blandine, happily married to Emile Olivier, a future prime minister of France, was to die following childbirth a few years later. His surviving child, Cosima, the one he called his terrible daughter, would alone enjoy the affection of his later years. Theirs was to be a turbulent and complicated relationship, as Cosima devotes her life to the demands of being first Wagner's mistress, then wife, then widow, then caretaker of the Wagner legend at the fledgling opera festival at Bayreuth. The post in Weimar comes to an end, and Liszt and Karlin begin an even more difficult pilgrimage. Still intent on marrying, they go to Rome to directly petition Pope Pius IX to grant Caroline's annulment. If Liszt thought that the machinations of the French salons were intense, he was in for the surprise of his life once inside the palace intrigues at the Vatican. As the most famous artist in the world and a devout Catholic, Franz Liszt was on a first name basis with Pius who called Liszt my palestrina. But their friendship could not overcome the many voices within the Vatican that wished to thwart this marriage Caroline's cousins and in-laws still lay claim to her vast fortunes. They feared that her marriage to Franz would put her wealth beyond their grasp. Liszt and Caroline's 13-year effort to seek an annulment came to a head on January 7, 1861, when the Pope ratified the contested decision of the Holy Congregation of the Council to grant Caroline von St. Wittgenstein an annulment. While legal petitions to block the marriage continued to swirl all over Europe, they chose October 22nd of that year for the wedding date, Liszt's 50th birthday. Flowers were ordered, prenuptial communion was celebrated the night before, the matrimonial contract was written and posted as required. All was in the ready. However, the forces of church and man were arrayed against them. Caving into months of petitions from his cardinals, the Pope reversed himself on October 21st. 
At midnight on the eve of the planned wedding, the Vatican sent Caroline and Franz a letter denying the annulment. Neither Franz nor Caroline chose to contest this final blow. They were exhausted. They submitted to the will of the Catholic Church. Caroline and Franz would never live together again, but remained in Rome as trusted friends to the end. She continued to serve as executor of his estate and co-author on several of his literary publications. Set adrift once again, at age 50, Franz Liszt would now begin yet another pelerinage through the final episode of his life and career, this time alone. His hair had turned white, but he was still the most famous and sought after artist of his time. All his thoughts and letters from this point onward contemplate his legacy and eternal matters. My dear Caroline, the death of Rossini reminds me of my own. I wish and urgently command that my burial take place without show, be as simple and economical as possible. I protest against the burial such as Rossini's, and even against any sort of invitation for friends and acquaintances to assemble. Let there be no pump, no music, no superfluous illuminations, or any kind of oration. Let my body be buried not in a church, but in some simple cemetery, and let it not be removed from that grave to another. The contradictions of his personality became even more apparent in Rome. Eventually, he settles into a 10 by 15 foot cell in the monastery Madonna del Rosario, just outside the city. This austere, dilapidated, whitewashed room on the ground floor of the monastery would be his home for the next five years. In it, he had all that he needed, a wooden bed, a table on which to write, religious books for study, and a small piano with a missing D. Here he would write, compose, meditate, and prepare himself for the final chapter of his life. Yet even while Liszt was cloistered in the monastery atop Mont Mario, the outside world found his humble door. Just two weeks after entering the monastery, his friend, Pope Pius IX, came to Madonna del Rosario to see the celebrated artist. The Pope sang Italian arias, while Liszt accompanied the tuneful pontiff on the piano with the missing D. A few days later, Liszt descended from Mount Mario to perform a private concert in the Vatican for the Pope and his retinue. Caroline was furious that Liszt kept company with the Pope. She was particular peeved that he befriended Cardinal Gustav Hohenlohe, the very man who had schemed behind the scenes to thwart their marriage. What was Liszt up to? Was he reinventing himself at her expense? Friends wondered aloud if he had lost his mind. My life is simplifying itself, and the Catholic piety of my childhood has become a regular and also a regulating experience. He seemed unable to unburden himself. A great affliction has occurred in my life. Gustav Hohenlohe and Franz Liszt were cultivating each other. It was Hohenlohe who, on April 25th, 1865, performed the ceremony where Liszt was made an abbe of the Catholic Church. Taking the four minor orders of the priesthood fulfilled Liszt's lifelong interest in the Church. From then on, he was known as Abbe Liszt. He was not allowed to celebrate Mass or hear confession. He took no vows of celibacy and was able to retract at any time. I do not in the least intend to become a monk. It is enough for me to belong to the hierarchy of the church to such a degree as the minor orders allow me to do. Both men had gotten what they wanted. Liszt had finally entered the ecclesiastical stake that had called to him his entire life. Hohenlohe had provided the Holy Roman Catholic Church with a world-famous celebrity ornament. Caroline was to sequester herself for the rest of her life in an apartment not far from the church of their thwarted marriage. There she smoked strong cigars 
and wrote dozens of treatises on the foibles of the Catholic Church <laughs> while she waited for Liszt to visit her. Liszt always seemed to keep two Roman residencies simultaneously, an urban apartment where he socialized and taught piano students, and a quiet religious retreat typically removed from the hubbub of the city where he could meditate and compose. Villa d'Este, Cardinal Hohenlohe's palatial villa on the outskirts of Rome. This 15th century retreat with its magnificent fountains, cascades, and pools inspired water play architecture all over Europe and beyond. To list, Villa d'Este was not just a natural wonderland, but evidence of the genius of man could harness and engage with the forces of nature in the service of beauty and elegance. At the invitation of Cardinal Hohenlohe, this was to be the spiritual retreat for Abbe Franz Liszt until his death in 1886. He came and went as he pleased, traveling from the mountaintop retreat to the city to visit Caroline, teach piano master classes, and meet with the Pope. Here, inspired by the nexus of man and nature, he wrote some of his most impressionistic piano works. A generation before Ravel and Debussy were to make the term impressionistic music an international phenomenon. Here is Liszt's reflection on the scene. His 1883 composition, Le Jeu d'eau à la Villa d'Este, The Fountains of Villa d'Este. <laughs> Thank you. 
the last two decades of his life, Liszt settled into a new no nomadic routine. Wearing his abbe's cassock everywhere, he began to live part of each year in three cities, Budapest, Weimar, and Rome. He came to embrace the wonders of train travel and know all the schedules, often traveling third class, composing through the night as soot and ash billowed through the train car. In Budapest, the city father fathers sought to woo back their favorite son. They built a new conservatory of music and invited Liszt to be its director. In Weimar, he renewed his friendship with Carl Alexander and held world-famous master classes for piano students from all over the globe. These two cities represent professional obligations that he was willing to pursue. Rome, on the other hand, was for him his spiritual retreat. But even there, he had famous visitors, Edvard Grieg, Claude Debussy, Alexander Borodin, Edward McDowell, Anton Bruckner, and others came to meet the legend, Abbe Franz Liszt. But age and celebrity finally began to take their toll. When critics reviled his music, he advised his students not to endanger their careers by programming his compositions. With the rise in nationalism, Hungarians were looking to establish a strong national identity. Many had not forgotten the scandal of his 1859 book on gypsy music in Hungary. They felt Liszt was too German or too French. In Hungary, Abbe Franz Liszt was simply not Hungarian enough. His close association with the music of Richard Wagner drew charges that he too was anti-Semitic. The concert audience that he helped to create now turned against him and his more daring late works. The impressionistic piano pieces like Le Jeu d'eau à la Villa d'Este drew sharp criticism from the academic music community he helped to establish. His physical condition began to deteriorate. He had a bad fall and his eyes grew weak, but he continued to travel between the three cities he now called home. At times, his legs were so swollen that his students had to lift him from the train in Weimar. My sight is going, dear friend, and I can no longer write without difficulty. His drinking increased. Brandy and now absinthe became his daily companions, increasing his dark moods. Everyone is against me. Catholics because they find my church music profane. Protestants because to them my music is too Catholic. <laughs> Freemasons because they think my music is clerical. To conservatives, I am a revolutionary. To the futurists, I am an old Jacobin. To by right, I am not a composer, but a publicity agent. The Germans reject my music as French, the French as German. To the Austrians, I write gypsy music. To the Hungarians, foreign music. And the Jews loathe me, my music and myself, for no reason at all. Through his bitter depression, he continued to work on a new book, Sketches for a Harmony of the Future. In it, Liszt describes the final goal of the evolution in music to be the achievement of a state of omnitonic. Every note is its own tonic, something akin to the 12 tone theory that would be fully postulated by Arnold Schoenberg a generation later. That this man who studied with Salieri and Czerny would conceive of a musical language without tonality is revolutionary indeed, as radical as conceiving a world without gravity. He wrote to Caroline in 1883 that he was prepared to hurl my lance into the boundless realms of the future. There is no better example of what Liszt had on his mind than his penultimate composition, Bagatelle sans tonalité, Bagatelle without tonality.
These are the faces of Franz Liszt. This is the music of Franz Liszt. Pianist, composer, father, friend, entrepreneur, conductor, author, benefactor, biographer, Kapellmeister, Abbe, lover. Franz Liszt, a man of three centuries. He was a study in contradiction. He is for us today a very 20th century figure, presenting his ambiguities without apology, adopting an existential stance with regard to events and persons around him. He spent all of his time and energy being Franz Liszt. Perhaps Princess Caroline said it best. Liszt had thrown his lance much further into the future. Several generations will pass before he is fully understood. Let us begin that understanding in this year, the Franz Liszt Bicentennial Year. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday, Maestro. maestro. 